You're listening to the Think Unbroken podcast, and I'm your host, Michael Unbroken. I'm an author, speaker, coach, and advocate for adult survivors of childhood trauma and abuse. In this podcast, you will learn how to transform your trauma into triumph, turn breakdowns into breakthroughs, and go from victim to being the hero of your own story. You can learn more at thinkunbrokenpodcast.com. And of course, check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify at Think Unbroken Podcast. Hey, what's up, brothers? Welcome back to Unbroken Men Podcast. Today, we're joined by Ken Canyon. Man is absolutely incredible. He is a relationship and communication coach, millions of views on social media, a serial entrepreneur. The dude's written more books than you will probably ever read in your life, and he is a reality <laughs> TV star. Uh, we had the the pleasure of meeting each other at an event uh, in Miami last year. Ken, brother, welcome to the podcast. I appreciate you, Michael. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's an honor, man. I, I, we, I've, we been, I've been waiting on the call. I've been waiting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting, man. I was on I was on hiatus for right after that event. I went from there to South America for four months, and I needed oh, wow. a little bit of wow. me time. I needed to step. Yes, away. it's yes. It's, conversation we don't have enough about men and we're like power through figure it out man up and i'm all about all that but bro sometimes you got to have the mental health break so been looking forward to doing this but i could not have done this if i did not take care of me first and i'm very pro me i'm not i'm not i'm not sans ken i'm just more pro me no no so. no i know it and, <laughs> and i appreciate that because that's one of the messages that i tell men and i imagine we can get into that but why to be the technical reasons why it's important from um, a personal development standpoint. So I look forward to it. I'm glad you yeah. did that. Yeah. And I definitely want to get into that with you too. You know, one of the things that struck me just immediately about you, one, you have a big personality. I mean, for those mm -hmm. watching on YouTube, yeah. you'll see you got the big old glasses on, they're <laughs> neon orange, like you, you know, and you're a big guy. You're like, you're my size, you're a big walking human being. Right. And you just got a heart of gold, man. And, you know, the thing that I was thinking about and preparing to talk to you today, it was like, how do we help men get into this place of this healed masculinity? Because right. here's how I look at my life. Dude, I shoot guns. I drive a big truck. I do martial arts. But, man, I write poetry. I cry. I read books. And it's mm -hmm. like, how in the world do we help guys get to that place? And so what I'm curious, can how did your journey to the man that you are today begin? Well, well, that's a very good question. How did it begin? I think, you know, I was fortunate enough to have a father, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of men don't, but I was fortunate enough to have a father who was a masculine man and who, you know, who always told me that no matter what I could be, whatever I wanted to be, I was just as smart as everybody else. However, that same man, did not, we didn't talk about emotions though. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about how we felt about things. Um, you know, while he told me to strive, to go get it, to, to, to never quit, he never told me, well, sometimes I sit back, it's okay to cry. He never told me mm -hmm. those things. And so I didn't learn those things till later or until, but because I used to associate those things with weakness, which is terribly wrong. But I realized that I wasn't alone that it's pervasive in our culture that, and often in, in, in my coaching, because I coach men too, I tell the man, one of the things we have to be conscious of is that men have been conditioned not to communicate, conditioned, or another word is program. And, and let me explain it to you. So from the ages of, from the third trimester in their mother's stomach, to seven years old, our subconscious minds are being full. Okay. We have our conscious mind thoughts we are aware of. Our subconscious mind is like our computer that we run off of the thoughts, beliefs, and everything. So we don't have a subconscious mind until these, we look into our world around us. As we're seven years, up to seven years old, we look to the people around us. And what happens is, is we have been programmed to believe that. Okay, sharing our feelings is a sign of weakness. For instance, when, when a man is young, a little boy is young, what do they say? Suck it up. Don't cry. They put some say, dirt on it. Put, put some dirt on it. They say, hold it in. Don't be no little bee. 
They tell you all these things. So the little guy associates sharing emotions as a sign of weakness. And then that little boy grows to be a 25-year-old man and a 35-year-old man or a 45-year-old man. And the only time we express our emotions is when we're mad. It's okay when you're angry, but then we don't know how to, we only project anger. So the person sees you as, oh, I'm scared of, you know, and that, and what it is, is we've never been taught emotional intelligence. We've been conditioned to keep it in. So I, I, I had to go on a journey to, cause I used to be real angry, not angry. I just used to get mad when things didn't go my way. And I, and I realized as I became more emotionally intelligent that I, my outcome, I wasn't getting what I wanted. I wasn't succeeding because of my attitude, because of my anger. And I was like, something's got to change. Something's got to change. And so that began my journey uh, roughly in my 20s. Uh, that began my journey on realizing um, who I was and how to become more emotionally intelligent. When my one of my best friends told me this, I'll never forget it. He said that I was in business with four, three other guys, and he said none of them like me. I was like, they don't like me. And then my anger kicked in. I was like, I don't care what if they like me or not. Then he said, that's the reason why they don't like. Me. That's exactly right. That's and I, and it was like an epiphany. And it, the whole weekend after he taught it, I looked at me. And I said, I've got to be better. I can't go through life like this. And so that was the start of it. Yeah, that's powerful. And and you know what I will say is you 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 have to be resilient as a man. Like sure. there is there is something to being able to control your emotions, not letting them get the best of you, putting them where they need to be, assessing them when you need them, and being in control of your life. That is, it's a game changer. And like you. I had no control over my emotions in my teens and in my twenties. I would explode at anything. Yes. Dude, I, I probably between birth and 26, when I said I will never get in a fight again, I probably was in 200 physical fights. <laughs> well, you know what I, I mean? I, oh, wow. I would blast somebody over nothing, Ken. I would be like, you, you looked at my shoes the wrong way, bro. Are you crazy? Right. Right. And then you you realize the, the last fight I ever got in was on 4th of July. I'm 26 years old. Wow. And I punched my little brother in the face. He just, you know, he knew how to push me. You know, brother, that's what brothers do. Oh, absolutely. They're not a push. And, and I looked at him and I was like, I'm done with this, man. Yeah. The week before, just the week before, I had choked this guy at a bar. You know, and Ken, it was out of control, man. Right. There was this thing that it was going to get me killed. Right. Like it really was, it's going to get me killed. It was going to get me arrested or locked up. It was probably going to ruin my life. And, and it was right in this window where I'd started this journey to figure out who I was because at, at 26, man, I'd made a million bucks, but I was 50 grand in debt. I was 350 pounds smoking two packs a day, eating chocolate cake for breakfast, cheating mm -hmm. on my girl. Like my, my life was absolutely upside down because like you, I got told that boys do not have emotions, put some dirt on it and don't be a right. Right. And, and I, and I, and I, I applaud you because when you make, when you became conscious of it, see, this is, this is the part where a lot of guys, a lot of guys don't do what you've done. A lot of us have experienced anger issues, all this, but what you did, you had what I call a C moment. A C moment is a significant emotional event that actually triggers a response in us that breaks a pattern. When you looked at your brother, this is my brother. This is, this is a guy I love. And I just hit him in the face. And so it's something about that that said to you, I must change. See, a lot of us, we get to the point where we say, I want to change, I ought to change, I should change. But only when, when it becomes a must that what we do is we trigger another response inside of us. And it all happens internally. And for me, that day when he said, they don't like you, nobody likes you. And I thought that was a, a significant emotional event that caused me to trigger uh, this, this, this chemical change within us. 
And so hmm. I, I'm excited that you that you did it. And what I, I've endeavored to do is help men find that place where it becomes a must. Yeah. It, and it has to be, right? You, you, We live in a society being ran by man boys, right? Men right. children. And it's, right. and it's, right. it's wild if you look at it because you have so much of this unhealed energy and I don't, I don't believe there's toxic masculinity. Like I hate that phrase. I think it's, I nonsense. hate that phrase. I'm, I'm glad you agree. And what I look at in this is I go, these are men who are hurt. Yes. These are unhealed men who have not yet leveled up. They're not toxic. I never, I never in the men that I've coached over the years, thousands of men can, I never sat across from one of them. was like, ah, oh, that guy's the toxic one found him. Right. What it is, it's behavioral patterns. It's, it's these moments of time that we get trapped into from our childhood that we don't heal, that we don't take responsibility for. They infect, they infect, I'm using the word infect because it, it comes in, it seeps in like a parasite and it takes, right. it infects our relationships, our money, our health. It destroys everything that we touch when we are still operating in that childlike space. True. You're the relationship guy. And I wanted you on to specifically talk. I love that we set this framework because so much of relationships are built in what you just said. These C moments. Right. How did you become the relationship guy? Um, I think that's a, <laughs> you know, I never set out to be the relationship guy. And I don't think, I don't know if you set out to be the, the unbroken, the healing guy, uh, you know, um, you know, I often say, I was like, it was thrust upon me, but I just accepted the mission. And what, and what happens is, and, and just like your journey, uh, 16 years ago, my wife and I were headed for a divorce court. I'll never forget it. We couldn't stand each other. We couldn't communicate everything I said. She hated everything she said. I hated. And I'll never forget that, uh, I was like, in my, in my head, I'm like, all this time we dated, I, I, married, I married the wrong person. Well, oh, no, what up? I didn't realize was, think about it like this. We, uh, one of my ex-coaches said this. He said, he said, life wouldn't be so hard if we didn't expect it to be so easy. And when he said that to me, I was like, wow, that is so deep. And so I applied it to relationships after that. I expected it would be easy because we loved each other, right? But I was never coached on how to communicate. I was always, I never shared my feelings because as I grew up, I didn't want to be the little that showed weakness. I didn't know how to communicate because I was a matter of fact person, but I never took her feelings in consideration. And so I had all this going on in me. And what happened was I had never done the work on me to become the man who could have the type of relationship that I wanted. And so when this occurred, when we were going through this, well, I'll never forget this day. We were arguing back and forth. I've never put my hands on my wife, ever. But the words I said were so detrimental and so hurtful. They were worse than me touching her physically. Well, this day we were arguing back and forth, back and forth. And my wife, to her credit, I don't know where she mustered this up. She said it was God. But she said, ask me, can we go for a ride? And I'm like, Go for a ride. I don't even want to be in the same house with you, let alone the same <laughs> car with you. But so for some reason, you know, I went. And when I asked her to this, about, about, about a year ago, I asked, I asked her, why did you want to go for a ride? She said, I saw our home as the place of bad energy. And I said, oh, if wow. we could get out, maybe the energy could change. And that was prophetic because we got in the car, we ride down the street. She's looking out her window. I'm looking out my window. I don't want to talk to her. She didn't want to talk to me. But she said, it's funny. She said, I'm hungry. You, and listen, we both had that in common. I was hungry at the time. And it was funny because I had just gotten off the show, The Biggest Loser. I lost 100, 130 pounds at the time, I believe. I wasn't even eating fast food. And the other thing, Michael, here's the, here's the thing that, that, that blows me. I... I didn't have any money because I, I, it took, I took eight months off from working. And she had the care to, to know because I went to get my health back. I was out filming a reality show. And I said, she said, pull over in that Wendy's. I said, I, I don't have but $7. She said, pull over. So we went to the drive-thru, and I'll never forget this. Today. I did a video that said how $7 saved my marriage. And 
we we got two happy meals that were two ninety nine a piece, some special they had. And when we were pulling through the drive through, she said, "Pull in a parking space." And I looked at her and said, "For what? For what?" And she said, "Please." I'm glad she said please, because I did it. Because if she had said something smart, I'd have just kept driving. <laughs> And, and and when she pulled over, she looked at me and said, we're going to sit here till we figure out what's wrong with us. Mm. Two hours and 42 minutes later, we came up with a conflict resolution system that saved our marriage. I learned more about her in the two hours and 42 minutes than I had known in the years we had dated. And that was when it was right after that when I realized, if I could put this back together... I could help other people do it. And the seed was born then. Now, I had to do the work. That took me about, it took us about two to three years to get to the point where I started coaching other people. But that the seed was born right then that I said to myself, you know what? I am going to be a man of integrity. I'm going to fix this relationship. I'm going to do my part. And the rest is history. And that was six years into the marriage. We've been married 22 years. Man, that's unbelievable. You, we are presented with opportunities through pain. I think about this every day. The only way you change is when the pain is just so painful, you can't take it anymore. And a lot of people, man, they would have went down that divorce path. We live in a society 50 plus now heading to 60% divorce rate. Mm -hmm. 80% of those divorces initiated by women. Men don't know why. I know why. I've never been married and I know why. One of the things, Ken, I'm, I feel so fortunate about in my journey now heading at you know 38, 39 years old almost is being studious of the mistakes of others. I have saved myself a <laughs> tremendous amount of time, effort, energy, and money. Now, look, a lot of the mistakes I had to make, I'm Ken, I'm the same guy I put a fork in the electrical socket as a kid, all right? I don't <laughs> learn the easy way. But there's certain things I sit and I take it in and I go, why? Why are 80% of divorces initiated by women? This is my guess, and I would love to have the back and forth here because I know a lot of married men are going to listen to this. I soon will hopefully be a married man and have okay. a family of my own. It's on my agenda. It's on my to-do list. I tend to do my to-do list very well. Very well. But, I, but what, I, what I think about often is it's. I think there's a couple of things that happen. One, I want to lay them out, and then you hit me back your thoughts on this. Sure. One, I believe that women feel unseen. You're the communication guy. We talked about that too. I think the number one thing women need is communication. I, agree. I think number two, they need to feel safe. And I don't mean safe in the streets. I mean, safe in their home, mm -hmm. right? Your wife said something unbelievable. Like this is the place where the pain is in our home. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that I think that they need is they need a, a decisive man of conviction. Mm -hmm. They need a man who is leading. And we live in this weird space right now. You and I have talked about this. Where being a man is under scrutiny. It's under fire. That's why I created this show because I sit here and I look at these guys who have so much incredible opportunity in front of them, but they're terrified to even pull the pants up, put their boots on and walk out of the street because they might get shot down by the sheriff. You know, and it's like being a man's impossible. So I think, think women want to be seen, understood and communicated with to feel safe, which I think is the byproduct of that communication. And then they want a man of conviction and integrity. And I think that because of the childhoods that we come through, because of the media, because of the things that we're consuming, we as men have failed to be able to live up to standards that A, we should be setting ourselves, and B, that in reality, we live in this weird red pill world with guys like Kevin Samuels, who I love in a lot of ways and who I don't in a lot of ways. Andrew Tate, who I love in a lot of ways and who I don't in a lot of ways. And then guys like you, who I love in a lot of ways and I don't in a lot of ways. And what I'm always trying to get down to here, Ken, is like, what, as the expert, what am I missing in what I just said? Okay. I'm glad I took notes because as I always I saw do, that. Uh, Me too. <laughs> so, so you said, you said, I got three reasons why women do 80%. And you said, First reason is uh, they want to be seen. And, and I would add they want to be heard, too, because they want to be communicated to. Uh, and then you said they want to feel safe. And then you said um, that, um, what, what did I can't read my own right? Something. Conviction and integrity from okay. a man. Conviction and integrity. Okay. So I think 
that's one of the reasons. And I also think that there, there are two reasons. While I like these three reasons, Michael, I like them. But there is a fourth and a fifth reason. Okay. Number number one, the fourth reason is, is the masculine energy in this masculine grid that we live in. Because in think about it, women are responsible for over 70% of the buying decisions in America. They're making more money than ever. They're doing, they're, they're making more money and they're using this masculine energy to move up this grid, right? Well, what happens is, and I've got to throw this in there because I see it so much, is that now, because I use this masculine energy to progress in my career, I think the same energy is going to help me cultivate a great relationship. When in fact, many of the times it does not. Because if you think about it, when and I and this I'm glad this is a man show because you got you will understand what I'm about to say. When a woman that I love comes home and she's telling everybody what to do at work because she's got that thing going on, she's making money. She comes home, she brings that energy home. She tells me what she begins to the same thing, telling me what to do. And so the man who who has been reared mostly in masculine energy, we both we all both have masculine and feminine energy. Mm -hmm. What the problem is, is because when a man sees masculine energy in another man, he knows how to react. He either confronts it, Mm -hmm. I'm okay, or he calculates, let me walk away from that, the risk is too great. But he knows what to do. He, he, He can calculate. When that energy comes out of the woman he loves, because it's coming out of that vessel, he doesn't know what to do with it. Some men will argue all the time. It's a back and forth. It's a, uh, I'm, I'm arguing. It's, it, be, it becomes a combative relationship. Or he goes in his cave and he won't say, mm. I, don't, I won't even talk. I was that one. Yeah. And, and so we won't say. And what happens? L- a lack of communication leads to what I call um, the, 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 now the brain begins to create community, create. It's one of it's like the hyperbaric chamber. You ever they say when you get in the hyperbaric chamber, it's like you ever heard what what no, no sound sounds like? Nothing. Mm-hmm. No sound. They say it's the weirdest thing because you can't hear anything. And and what it is, is when you it's called sensory deprivation. Whenever you don't get feedback, you man goes in his cave, you start creating the feedback. And that's what she starts doing. Oh, you don't love me. You're seeing somebody else. And that's mm-hmm. how it starts. And so what I tell people is, I say, that, that's the fourth reason um, why they filed because they created that. And now they say, well, you know what? I'm making money. I'm listening to other people. And then, and then, and then, and then the fifth one. I guess, and, I, and I was talking to, I remember I was talking to um Someone recently, a high profile client celebrity who said this, I got a divorce because I was listening to the wrong. Yep. See, number five True. is this right here. The five is I'm listening to people who do not have the thing that I desire. Yep. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment. I want a great relationship, but I'm getting advice from people who don't have a great relationship. I'm getting it. I want to be healed, but I'm getting advice from broken people. Now I know we all have to do healing, all of us. It's it's an ever it's a it's it's a journey, something that, that that goes on all the time. I get that, but but when you add in those two with the other three that you said, now you have now I think the dichotomy of it, and now it makes sense for why women will do that. So I agree with your three, but I want to add in the fourth and the fifth one that actually rounds out the reason why. You know, 80% of them are filing for divorce. Yeah, I love that. And I appreciate that. And I and like you, I take notes. I'm very studious. I'm, I'm doing this to learn and help other men learn as well. You know, you, you said something really interesting. Number five could not make more sense to me. It is like, I, I think about this all the time. Like, if, why in the world would you ever, ever, ever go and learn from someone who hasn't done what you are trying to do? Right. Why it's in the kinda- world would you ever? It's like, if you think about it, man. 
like as someone who has built multiple businesses, traveled right. the world, spoken on the biggest stages, why would I ever go learn business advice from somebody who yeah. works at a grocery store? That, that, that makes too much sense. And, and so I was thinking about that for me. When I first, you know, when I got in business, why would I go? I'll give you another example, which makes too much sense. I was, when I was, you know, when I was 430 pounds and I was trying to lose weight, I was not going to go get advice from somebody who was 600 pounds. I just wasn't going to do it. It didn't make sense. Mm. And so that's what we're doing in relationships. What we are doing is we are getting advice from people who really don't even have the capacity, the capacity to give us sound advice because they never achieved it or they, or, or, or for some, and so, we, so what happens is, is now we go on emotions. We go, you know, oh, okay, you made me feel, feel a certain way because the people who are close to us, they just want us to feel better. So what they do is they tell us that we, that they think will make mm -hmm. us feel better. And, and that's flawed. It's flawed. Yeah. It's dangerous too, right? And it's, and it's really interesting when you break it down and you look at these dynamics and it's not to say like, let's be clear. I want to, I want to be clear about this because this, this is a show for men. I know women are listening and we appreciate right. you ladies, right, right. but this is a, a show for men. Sure. And I absolutely. do not want guys to listen to this and assume that we are saying that women rule the home and that they are in charge and that we need to bend ourselves to them because that's not right. what it is. That but is for, not what it is. What we're, what I'm saying, and obviously, can I want your opinion? What I am saying, and I believe this to be true. This is all through my own failures, by the way. Can I, I sit here as a man in full nakedness, admitting that the woman I should be married with and have kids with, I ruined that relationship because I cheated on her because I broke down because I was in a moment of pure weakness in my childhood space, unhealed looking back on a relationship that was the best thing I ever had because yes. I was scared. And so when I, ha when I made the decision to come in here and create this, I wanted to do it with full honesty and full truth, knowing now looking back and now having been single for a very long time, waiting and hoping that she shows up one day, praying to God with frequency. Um, <laughs> you right, know, right, right, right. I, I, I put myself in this position to want to be studious, to understand these dynamics. And so when we're having this conversation, we're not saying it's men's fault. It's not even women's fault. It, I, I cannot help but think of this term and we hear it all the time and it's not mine and I'm just using it, but weak times make weak men. And we are in a space of weak men. We just are. And it's unfortunate. How do you. I'm going to ask you a two-part question and we can come back to it because it's probably going to be pretty convoluted. How do you become a man of strength, of integrity, a leader in your home mm -hmm. in consideration of being on the verge of divorce, losing everything, being almost the biggest loser, pun intended, <laughs> and... What do guys need to be taking into consideration to have the relationships that they want to have right now? Right. So it, the, the answer to that isn't as convoluted as it might seem. Because, you know, when people come to me, I always say we start at the bottom. And what do I mean by I'm starting at the bottom? We start with the most important relationship you will ever have. And that is the relationship with yourself. And so when I get deep into, you, you said something quite interesting. You said at a moment of weakness, you know, I did something, I made a decision, I made a bad choice that cost me the woman of my dreams. Okay. And so each man listening to this has made bad choices. Yours, yours truly made bad choices. Those bad choices have dictated the life that I live in many cases now, but it's how I use the bad choices. See, we can choose to use them and to grow from them. So what I tell men is what we, where we start at is we start with you. We start a deep dive of who I am. Because how can I, how can I protect, as you said, make a woman feel safe, communicate with her, be a man of, of, of respect, and all of these things that I should be without knowing who I am. 
And so my first thing is I have to decide that I've got a personal thing to develop me. I've got to become a better, diver- better version of myself. And then I teach them what that looks like. Right? And I want one. to interrupt you real quick because Go ahead. how a, bo- a guy like me, okay. no, never met my father. Stepfather, a guy your size, we're the same size, six foot mm-hmm. four plus 252, two, beat the crap out of me as a child. Mm-hmm. I had no measurement for manhood of any capacity. It took me rock bottom to figure out how to do this self thing. Right. If you're if you're a guy like me, knowing, and especially I'm a guy of color, I'm biracial, black and white, you're a black man living in America. You know as well as I do, most the majority of low of 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 homes in this country that are minorities have no father figure in them. Sure. We have no space for knowing even where to begin with self. Okay. Where where do you start? Like if I'm listening, Ken, I'm 22, my life's a disaster. I'm making a hundred G's a year. I'm chasing money and girls, living my Jay-Z lifestyle, but my my, my shit is real backwards real backwards or I'm 35 or 40 or whatever that age is and things are not working. And I hear you telling me, well, you got to do this internal work, but I've never had a sense of self. Where does that begin? Like, what is step one? So that's a very good question. And and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely tell you something so that it's going, it's going to blow you away. Number one, you got to have a desire to do it. The only mm-hmm. way you change is I couldn't put it in you. You had to come with the desire, okay? I got I had to get to the point where it was a must. Remember I talked about the seagull. So that part has to, you got to say, I have a desire to do it, right? And so here's what I did. I want to I wanna use a real world example. So I wanted to be, I had been coaching. And I had clients and I said, I've got a message. I don't know where to start. All of these people out here need to hear this message. I know that I have something. I had a desire. Start with desire. Second thing is willingness to do the work. So I have this thing, right? I I have this thing. I often ask my, my students, what comes first? Desire, willingness to do the work, or belief? And, and, and almost, almost 90% of the people get it wrong. They say, believe, mm-hmm. desire, willingness to do the work, or, or, or some combination. But they never say, desire comes first, willingness to do the work, and belief is last. Because think about it. You just told me, Michael, um, I had no basis to believe that I could have this because I had no father figure. I had my stepfather be around me. And so my, I have no basis to believe. Believe comes as a result of the brain sees you seeing you doing a behavior over and over again. The reason you believe you can have a great podcast and get millions of downloads and all because you did it over and over again, right? Your brain saw it. Your subconscious mind began to get conditioned to a new way to think. But it was only because you had an intention, a desire to do it. Then you start doing the work and then the belief comes last. So I tell people, desire comes first. I'm going to give you a simple way to do it. Second way, all you have to do, and this is what I tell my people, type in on YouTube University, I'm being practical. Become a better version of yourself. I want to be a better me. I told somebody this the other day. They didn't know me from out. They they couldn't afford me. I said, type in on YouTube because somebody else I'm not I said, somebody else did a video and that, and they don't want you to listen to it every day. And why do I don't want you to listen to it every day? Because what happens is the more you listen to it, the more you get conditioned to a new message. If I'm on the street, so let's say I'm on the street selling drugs, but every morning I wake up, how to be a better man. I'm listening to it. I'm taking it into my subconscious. What's happening to me? All of a sudden, my actions on the street and the more I listen to it will become incongruent. They're go, they're, there's going to be friction. I'm going to have mm-hmm. problems thinking about, I know I should be a bad man. And all you did was plant the seed. See, and every day you water it. 
So that's why I tell people, start right there. The more you do it, and then all you got to do, then what's going to happen is it's going to tell you, hey, listen to your affirmations every day. I don't even have to listen, look at the video. I know no matter who said it, dude in Utah, dude in Alabama, dude in New York, it's going to come back to the same process. Some people will say it differently than you might say it differently than me, but it's going to come back to the same process. Read these books. Okay. Listen to this. Say affirmations. Journal your journey. All of a sudden, if you start doing one of them, what are we doing? Reconditioning our subconscious mind. And that's how I tell people. I, I, I'm, I'm practicing as hell. And so that's my process. Because maybe you can't afford, you, 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 you don't have the wherewithal to afford a coach. You know, maybe they can't hire uh, Michael and Broken. They, maybe they can't hire you. Maybe they can't hire Coach Ken. But this is where you start. I did this. I did this when I wanted to become an influencer. I wanted to get my message out. I went on YouTube because you got a whole bunch of messages. A whole bunch of, a bunch of messages. How can I become? And I listened to it every day. And all of a sudden, they said, put out one video a day. And that's what I did. I didn't know how to edit. I just turned my phone towards me. And all I did was say, no, coach, far away. And he used to tell Amanda Bowden, I swear to God is my witness. I got 1.2 million followers now. And that's how I did it for a whole year. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show. But I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. You know what comes so much value in that, Ken, which I appreciate tremendously. I'm, I'm just taking notes over here like it's my job, which it kind of is. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, the the thing that I took away from that more than anything is like you you must want this more than you want anything. And, yes. and I, I fear that we live in a complacent society mm -hmm. of men who are. So I, I re, I'll, I'll share this. So recently I sat down and I reevaluated my values. For a long time, my my values were honesty, kindness, leadership, self-actualization. And they got me to where I was. But, you know, Ken, we were speaking before, I, I hit this plateau and I was like, do I close the business? I'm kind of burned out. What's going on? Maybe I need to step away. And then I, I evaluated my values again. I realized really what my values are and what is going to take me to the next level is strength, love honor and courage. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those are really core tenets of, of how I would define my manhood. And I think that a big part of the reason why most people, men do not have desire for success in any capacity is they're apathetic. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of guys are just sitting here and being like, woe is me, True. which you know, you look at, you look at your life and I would argue that, and I don't know. And so that's why we're having the conversation. I would guess at some points you were that guy as well. I know oh, I certainly was. Absolutely. How did I went, you I went bankrupt? I, I went bankrupt. Dude, I never forget it. I was in partnership with four guys. And I never forget it. We uh we were young and we would I was this whiz kid. I was at Black Enterprise. I was on CNN, a home shopping channel. And I never forget it. My my partners were with me. And all of a sudden, we took a bad turn, and we weren't getting business anymore. Young didn't know a lot as much, and we went bankrupt. And my name was the only one on the loan from the bank, mm. and they abandoned me. Oh, man. Uh, all except for one of them. We're still we're best friends today. Uh, there were five of us, and one of us did. And the woman I'm married to today, it was her and him. Those were the only two standing. When the dust cleared, they were the only two standing. And uh, I remember I was depressed. I, I went home. The, the federal agents came and took my computers. They came and took the furniture. They took everything. They let me keep my house because I didn't have any any equity in it. But um, and 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 I never forget, man. I was like, God, how did this happen to me? But I didn't realize 
This is what I teach men. I ha- when If you change the way you look at things, Michael, you'll change what you see. Mm-hmm. You see, I could only see this is what happened to me. I didn't realize it was the prelude to me becoming who I am today. Because I took that experience, what I learned, and that's when I wrote my first book. And that's when I began teaching other people because I, I, I remember I stayed in the house with the, they, 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 they repoed my car. I didn't have a car, didn't have anything. Uh, but I still had who I was. And, uh, and, and I laid in the room with the, with the, with the, with the, with the blinds drawn. And I was like, I blame God. And then I said, one day I was laying there watching TV and I remember I, I, I lied about the lights, and, you know, back then you could float checks. <laughs> but, <laughs> live before your time, or you could float checks. I get so, it. Oh, I've, I've been there. It, and I, um, I said to myself, I asked myself, and this is how I help men. I always start with one question. We start the process with one question, Michael, and here it is. Is it possible? Dot, dot, dot. And that question I've developed in my coaching, is it possible that what I went through, there could be something good in it? Is it possible this experience could help me become a millionaire? When you begin asking that question, all of a sudden your brain tries to find the answer. And then I say, is it possible I could teach other people? At that moment, That was when I did what we call reframing. I reframed it because I could build a company that could make millions of dollars. Now, I I didn't know how to keep it yet, but I knew how to build it, I knew how to sell stuff. And that was spawned my first book. Well, one of eight books and uh, the rest is half a million books sold later. And that's how we got here. Asking those questions to question my beliefs, what I believed. And that, that's really turning your pain into purpose. Yes. I heard er- Eric Thomas, E.T., the hip-hop preacher. So I was, yes. I was with him. We were speaking at an event together. Um, I was speaking very early in the day. I'll put it that way. And <laughs> that, That's cool. You're speaking. And Eric, Eric, Eric said something really incredible. I, I always watch him on stage. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, I am so studious of him because he's so great. And he said, uh, you got to you might as well get paid for your pain. And I thought to myself, yeah, you might as well. You already suffered. And I was thinking about that in terms of relationships because there was a pain. Ken, I paid a price losing that woman. I do not get that back. All of this work, all of the everything and building into the man I am today to be a man worthy of the next and hopefully last incredible woman I'm with, it required that pain. That's a pain that like, dude, I'm, I, I think about this a lot. Like I may be my last thought on my deathbed was like, man, I really screwed that one up. But then I, <laughs> but then I also think, well, at least it's given me fuel to be a man who I am today, to lead these people, to stand on these stages, have these conversations. But I fear that a lot of guys right now, in the state of dating, you're out of the game, but I'm in it. Right. And I know a lot of my friends are, they, they feel like even though they have tried to become men of value and they might be six figure earners and they might be actually like out here doing the work, they're not still attracting the right woman. What are they missing? All right. So this is where I come in with, with what I do. Number one. And I, first of all, I help men get super clear about what they want, not what they think they want. So, so we start off like this. I said, well, first of all, what's more important? I'm going to ask you, Michael, because you're, you would be one of my clients that I'm looking for. I got, I got a half a million women that follow me, right? But a little more. So I'll be signing up this afternoon. So, (laughs) so I asked them, what's more important? Your wants or your needs? Needs all day. So they have to think about that though. Cause I said, and then I break it down. I say, well, okay. So one day you might want, today you might want Chinese food, but tomorrow you might want a steak, right? 
And, I, and they said, yeah. I said, well, your, your wants may change or will change, right? But what you need, the sustenance you need, the food you need to live will never change. And they say, yeah. And so first thing is we have to identify what we need. And most men have never done that. And so we live in a society that's microwave. Everybody, men and women, want, wanted to work quickly. We expected to work quickly, but we don't spend, we don't want to spend the time to figure out what we need. And then once we do that, we don't know. And this is why I've been so successful. I want to ask I, you a question about that. Go right ahead. Because let, let's say that men, and I, I suggest the same thing. You need to sit down and get crystal clear mm-hmm. about what you need. Crystal clear. And in fact, I, I won't, I'll keep it to myself, but there is a one, two, three, four page document about the woman that I am seeking. Physical, okay. mental, emotional, spiritual, sexual, uh, outcomes, financial, goals, and deal breakers. I went deep. Okay. I went as deep as I could. It took it's hours. It's good, deep. right? Okay. And then what I did, Ken, is I wrote the reverse. I said, who is the man I need to become to attract that woman? And that is even longer. That's good. That, that right there is, is more important than the otherness because we don't attract what we want. We attract who we are. See, the energy exude, I'm big with vibrational frequency and energy. If I am a man who is putting out an energy, I'm going to attract back that energy, okay? So if I'm putting out an energy of a goal-oriented person who is super caring, who is trustworthy, I'm going to get that back. Now, now, somebody might say, might challenge me on that and say, can I keep getting the wrong kind of women? I mean, I'm a man of this and that. And I say this, then there is something in you that it's telling you. Okay? Now, are you entertaining that? If you're not entertaining it, now what that means is that you're recognizing it quickly and then you're eradicating it. That's a good thing. The problem comes is, People say, I keep getting that, but I keep falling for the same person. Then there's something Mm -hmm. in you that is drawn to that character. Now, there's a difference with Michael says, hey, I identify, I see it, I rebel, I repel that because what I see in you, I don't want, okay? Because my energy, because your energy knows that you know it. Mm -hmm. But then what is it about you that entertains it? When you feel it, but you're in a because there's something in the energy. That's the question, that right? That's, that's the question. What? So you, you see a lot of these guys. Here's what I will say, and this is just on God honest truth. Mm-hmm. The, the caliber of women I dated when I was in my worst, I don't even understand how they could date a man like me. Mm-hmm. And the caliber of women that I have found myself around today are much more elevated. I'm not being dismissive of the women of the past. I'm just saying like attracts like energy attracts uh, energy. It does. And 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 I have this I have this very interesting belief. This is how I think about everything cuz what you said is how you look at things is how you see them, which I think is absolutely genius and I want people to like dudes put that in your brain. You have to understand perception is everything. Mm-hmm. And so I, I look at it now and I, I, I make one simple adjustment to everything in my life based on timeline. And I ask myself, if I didn't get it until the day before I died, would it still be worth it? And the answer for me is when it is unequivocally yes, it has raised my standard to never settle. A lot of guys are settling right now. I believe that. A lot of guys are settling. How do we pull them out of that? Well, what is that question? What is that thing in them that they are drawn to subconsciously that they need to eliminate and eradicate to be able to both be a man at the level deserving of the relationship that they want, but also to attract that woman? Oh, so the first thing they have, you, they have to ask themselves, what fear do I have? What am I scared of? Because when you settle, when you settle for something, 
What that is, is that's an indication that fear is driving you. Now, I want you to think about this for a little. I want you to think about that's this. That's gold. Because if I settle for something, that means that either I will not get what I fully want or I don't deserve what I fully want. Either way, is rooted in fear that I won't get it. Mm. And so what I say is, what are we scared of? First, we have to go we have to go deeper to figure out, okay, what is it that I'm afraid of? I'm afraid that I won't attract another person. Am I afraid of being alone? Am I afraid that nobody would want the kind of woman that I want won't want me? And once we identify that fear, then that fear is what we're going to cut because that fear is creating a limiting belief. The truth is, whenever you settle for something that you feel like that you deserve more, you will ultimately resent the thing you settle for. Mm -hmm. That's a hard reality. It is. The same way as like, Ken, let's call it what it is. You and I on our journeys, because we had a similar journey, especially on weight loss, we settled. Yes. We lowered our standards for ourselves. We made a decision that we, for whatever reason, that thing that was inside of us, that internal yes. temperature was was not right. And we we're like, okay, guess this is what it is. And yeah. then you make a decision. And, and I think that all all of life is about the decisions we make. Everything that has ever happened in our life, every choice we've ever made, every turn left and go straight and eat that or do this has led us to this moment. Yes. This is one of the things I absolutely love about life. There is no coincidence. <laughs> yeah. It's just I, not real. I agree. I agree. I agree. And I, and I fear my, my biggest fear, you know, it's funny. My brother won't mind me telling this story. So I won't say which one though. So one of my brothers, I have many, many brothers. I'll put it that way. Um, he was in this bad relationship, Ken. His, 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 his gauge internally was so low that he would accept anything. Right. So this is one of my brothers. Again, there's a lot of them. And he was dating this woman who had just had a child with another man who was cheating on my brother. And he knew. And one day, Ken, I had to sit him down. I, look, I have relegated the responsibility of coaching people to coach the people that want to be coached. I do not try to put that on people who don't want it. But I had hit my wall with him. And I sit in, and I, we were on phone and I go, you know what, man? I'm going to tell you something you need to hear. Because I, I believe this, Ken. I believe that truth will set you free. Mm -hmm. And I say, you, you don't want to hear what I'm about to say. You don't want to hear it. You're going to hear it anyway. You're dating our mother. Mm -hmm. And I sat across and I told him this and I just said, you got to understand you deserve more. Cause Ken, my mother was a drug addict, alcoholic, bipolar, narcissistic, and too institutionalized diet of an overdose. Wow. Totally took advantage of her children in every way was not there. Never showed up hurt in every way you can imagine. And I sat and I told him this and I asked him a very simple question. I said, don't you feel like you deserve more than that? Wow. Wow. How did he respond? It was hard for him because he, he sat and he go, yeah, I think you're right. And it was a powerful moment because I've dated my mother too. I think a lot of men have. I think we I think live in this. I think a lot of men. We live in this interesting time where, especially my age, you know, heading to forty and younger, right? There was no man in the house. True. We become we become son husbands. These em emotionally incestuous relationships with our our mothers and our grandmothers and the the women who raise us, and and it's un dude. This is so uncomfortable to talk about, but it has to be said. Right. And, and I think that the only way that guys are going to get through it is they need men like you. They need men like me. They need to get in the programs. They need to pay for it. They need to invest in themselves and, and, and they need to raise their standards because they do deserve more. Yes. Maybe I'm wrong. Ken. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I, I, I think you did. Um, I got a, I got a new client 
And he used to, he's been, he's been to prison for five years. And he, uh, he met a woman who was my client too. And he called me one day because she, after getting my coaching, is deciding that I want to be with him. I, 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 there is a, 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 a codependency relationship here. And so I got to want to call together. The reason I do that is because, not because I'm trying to coach them, because now they can see the other person in the truest, brightest light, because I'm going to ask questions that are going to reveal what's on the inside. Mm. So he sat there and she spoke her truth because it's a safe place because of my, the way I conduct it. You can't interrupt. She can't interrupt you. So after it was over, some things came out and he, and he's from the streets. I mean, when I say the street guy and he said, coach, can we talk? Sure. Let's talk. And he, and he told me he wanted, he wanted her back. I said, first thing you got to, again, become a better version of yourself. And here's what I said. If you ever, if you, I can't promise you you'll ever get her back. I can't. But here's what I can promise you. I can promise you if you become a better version of yourself, you will attract the woman of your dreams. It may be her, it may not be. Because I've done it with several guys. And he said, I said, but it's going to cost you. Mm. It's going to cost you. And the reason it's going to cost you is because you need to invest in yourself. And I said, and we went through the whole thing. And I said, here's what it's going to cost you. And you ready? Send me a deposit. And it, it was two weeks. And I said, I, I said, you, I said, I, I'm not going to call you back. I said, only when you believe, because I can't. Call, I'm not going to call you if you don't, if the desire to be better is not there. Same. Okay. And and no more, no more, no more game playing. No more trying to slip and dip and lie like you do, manipulate like you do her. And I called him for what it was. I said, "Nah, bro, I'm not. I'm not dealing with this." Shit. Mm -hmm. Three days ago, he he sent me he sent me the deposit. He said, "Coach, I'm ready. I'm ready to invest in myself." So we start next week. But because the reason why I say that is because of what you said, we've got to be willing to say, "I'm worth it." I'm worth it. Now, I know that now the woman may be the catalyst to get you there. That's cool. However we get there, my pain got me where I was. Your pain got you. You hit your brother. I, you know, I did all the shit that I did that got me there. I almost, uh, the doctor said I would have been dead in three years. Blood pressure was 220 over, I mean, over 160. And weight was 400 some pounds. He said, you're going to be dead So. And he didn't give, he was like, here's some medicine, take that. He said, you're a diabetic, all of these things. And I'm looking at him with tears in my eyes. Now I'm a, I don't, I don't think I'm a tough guy, but I'm pretty tough. And I'm crying and I'm like, this man does not give a shit about me. But I got to give a shit about me. Yeah. Why would he? Well, you don't care. He don't care. You don't care. He doesn't care. But, but I needed that. Mm -hmm. We need the truth, Ken. The truth will set you free. When I when I step into these conversations of vulnerability around health, wealth, relationships, sexuality, financial, whatever it is, as I build not only this show, but all the things that I've done for almost a decade, the reason why I tell the truth is because I know that somebody needs to hear it. You know, one of the things I get from my clients all the time, it's actually one of my favorite things, is they, they tell me this, Ken. You might not get this because you, you may have a different approach, but they, they tell me, you know, Michael, I really don't like you sometimes. Oh, yeah, I get that. Yeah, I get and that. I, and I go, my job isn't for you to like me. My job is to help you win a championship, baby. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I think that we need that. And I think as men that we need a little bit more truth. Yes. We need the truth. And I love that approach because... You're my best coach in football. I went to college on a football scholarship. The one that I disliked the most was the one who got the most out of me. Mm -hmm. He got the most out of me. And so, because he was the one that said, you're too slow. 
He was the one that said you're getting your ass beat. He was, <laughs> I mean, no, literally, he was the one that says, I thought you, you, you I thought you would, you said you're going to dominate him. He's dominating you. I mean, and it made me mad because I'm like, no, he's not. Well, <laughs> so, and uh, I, I think that that kind of coach uh, brings out the best. I love it, the truth part. That that's we gotta start from truth. Yeah. Gotta start from truth. You know what? I wasn't. You know, I I I want to be a good father. My wife and I. Let me. We'll, 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 I want to tell you what we do. Once a year or twice a year. We do what we call a relationship diagnostic. Mm. You know how you take your car when the, when, when the red light comes on or the check engine light comes on and you take it and put it up on the rack, right? To right. see what's wrong with it. Well, for me yeah. and my wife, what we do is we do it once or twice a year. To, and we have this formula, this format, where we look at our relationship from her perspective and from my perspective. And so we did the last one in... July, and we went to Jamaica. And almost every year, she says, shit, and I'm like, damn, I thought I was good. I'm, not, I'm working my <laughs> job to be the best father, grandfather, best husband. But you know what? Instead of getting upset, you know what I told her this year? I said, you know what, honey? I'm going to be better. Mm. I'm going to be better. I'm going to incorporate what you said. Now, now change might take me a minute because she said I work too much. She said that mm. sometimes she might feel lonely or neglected. And I was like, damn, for real? I can't have that. And, that, and so she would tell you that I've worked like hell on it. Cut work off. Let's go here weekend. Put my phone aside. That I've worked on it and I will continue to. But that truth hurts. But the truth helps you get better. It does. And the, the truth is, guys, if you're watching on YouTube, by the way, my camera just told me it overheated because Ken is so on fire right now. <laughs> so we did lose my video, but that's OK. You know, and, and I think that diagnostic is important. We need to do it as individuals. We need to do it in relationships. We need to do it with our finances. We need to do it with our health. And, and most importantly, Ken, and, and I think that you'll agree is sometimes you need a guy like a, a Ken or like a Michael in your life to sit across from you and, and keep it real with you. And as men, we, we, we cannot placate each other. We must, do you know what men are most successful? It's the men who have been challenged to rise to an occasion. True. You know, you, you look at the greatest men of all time, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, I mean, Thurgood Marshall, you look at these powerful men who have done things, JFK. I mean, it's unbelievable. I mean, I couldn't admit Marcus Aurelius, Kobe Bryant. I mean, David Meltzer, Tom Bilyeu, you, me, like we have all had to raise our standards to a challenge in front of us where we sat in front of something and we said, we don't like this. So we're going to do something about it. And yes. my, my friend, I, I applaud you for that. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions here. I know we're almost out of time, but there, there's a really interesting, I want to circle back to a couple names I mentioned earlier. One of the reasons that I started this podcast is because when I look at some gentlemen in the world who are promoting manhood and masculinity, mm -hmm. I don't align with it. I don't right. really align with red pill theory. I definitely don't align with Andrew Tate. Like if I have, if I was a father and I knew my son was listening to that dude, I'd be like, I have up real bad. <laughs> this is my opinion. I know people right. love him. I, I get right. it. Right. What, what are your, what are your thoughts about men in this concept of red pill right now? And what do they need to be cautious of? If anything, maybe you're a huge proponent. I don't know. That's why I'm asking I, the question. I, I am not. And so I talk about that because, you know, I'm a big proponent of energy, right? So I want you to think about even Kevin Samuels. The problem is a lot of what Kevin Samuels said was true. A lot of it had some truth base. The problem is, is the energy by which he presented it. See, he, mm. pre he presented it from a dehumanization standpoint. I may present the very same thing that he said, but I present it from from an uplifting, empowering standpoint, and then the end user receives it differently. See, red pill, blue pill, here's the problem. It's seeded 
in division. The mm. energy comes from a place of let's divide. All right, let's let's keep let's let because I believe that God wants um, you know I want lo love is the greatest of them all, and I believe that we let's empower the relationship. But when you talk about red pill, blue pill, it comes from a place of division. It comes from a place of anger. It comes from a place of bitterness. I understand you're trying to enlighten people, but you enlighten me from a standpoint of I'm angry at the other person. I'm angry. It's your fault. It's your fault. I am the way that I am. And so when you come from that mm. place, there cannot be any cohesion, no partnership. I cannot partner with somebody like that. You know what? And so that's the problem I have with it. I feel Andrew Tate does this exact same thing. I feel like where they, where they're coming from, that energy, it's the it's the energy of division, and that's my take. I've never heard anyone phrase it that way, and I think that you probably just summarize what I've been trying to extrapolate out of my own brain, because when I when I see these guys, I can't help but think that they have some unresolved wounds. Sure, and we. And we they all do. do. I mean, I'm never going to sit here and be like, I don't have wounds. I certainly do. Right. We but are. what I, what I will say about it is that I, I love that perspective before I can ask you my last question, Ken, where can everyone learn more about you? And especially these guys who need support, how can they come and be a part of your program? So what I would tell the guys, uh, reach out to me at coach Ken Canyon, um, dot com. Uh, I'm on every social media platform at Coach Ken Canyon. And I answer all of my DMs. I answer every single one, even though I finally got a team, but I answer every one of them. Because why? Because there are some people, see, I don't know who's on the other end. I don't know if that person on the other end is about to take their life, their own life. So what do I do? I make it a priority. Everybody's a priority now. We're growing. I may have to get somebody to start answering, but right now, that is what I do. Because they can reach out to me at Coach Ken Canyon on every platform that's Instagram, YouTube, um, TikTok, uh, even Facebook. Uh, and so that's what I do. And that's how you can find me. Amazing, brother. My last question for you. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? Wow, that question. I want to I give that some thought for a second. And I think there is a um, there is a process, and I forget the name of it. And I want I want I want I want to. It is when back into back in the fifteen hundreds, right? A Japanese emperor used to he broke his favorite law. He broke his favorite mug. And, and so they could not repair the mug. He sent it to craftsmen in his area, and they tried to repair the mug. And it never came back looking like he, like he wanted it. But it was a... Uh, and so what he did was he sent it to China, I think it was. And the craftsmen in China, what they did was they took the pieces of it. It's called Kintsugi. And what they did was they arranged the pieces back, but they arranged them with gold resin, okay? And so when the emperor finally got his mug back, he said, oh my God, it is different, but it's more beautiful. It's more beautiful than it was before it was broken. So, and so then it became a work of art. I think unbroken is kind of like that. We all have had things that have tried to break us or that may have broken us in the moment. But when we healed and we're put back together, we're added with the resins, the gold resins that make us this unique piece of art that God has created. And now it's not broken anymore. But now it's got the wisdom, much more wisdom, than it had before. And so now it's way more valuable 
It's got the more wisdom. And now it's uniquely designed for its purpose. I think that's what I'm looking at. And that's, that's what these men are. And that's why I started this show. Like your, your purpose is in front of you. You must elevate, you must raise your standards. You must get support, but know that you're already worthy. And I think that's the biggest thing, man. Like you are already worthy as you are, as a man, as a human being in the light of the eternals, God, spirit, universe, mother nature, however you identify however you your source. Say. Yes. And ultimately you are unbroken. Ken, my friend, thank you so much for being here. It was an honor to spend your time, my time with you. And for those of you listening, brothers, thank you. And until thank next time, be unbroken. You. I'll see you guys. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken.